fun. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Pat Flynn Show. I am excited for the discussion we are about to have and um, feel quite privileged to be joined by two men whose, whose work I have both enjoyed very much, Dr. Joshua Swamidas and Dr. Michael Behe. In fact, I have two of their books right here. Sorry, let me hold it in front of the camera. The Genealogical Adam and Eve. Um, uh, Dr. Swamidas, uh, I, uh, after this conversation, I would love to talk to you about maybe coming back on at another time to, to talk about that. I think it's a, I think it's an awesome contribution. Dr. Michael Behe's most recent Darwin devolves, and that will be the primary focus of our conversation today. Um, before we dive in, um, Dr. Behe's been on the show a number of times, but, um, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but oh, just maybe like two minutes of introductions, relevant background from each of you, um, who you are and, and what you do, and then uh, we can take it from there. Um, Dr. Swamidas, would you mind going first? Oh, well, thank you. I'm honored. Uh, I mean, Mike needs no introduction. I'm, I'm a lot newer to the scene. Uh, I uh, am a, I'm a scientist at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm also a medical doctor, but most of my time I spend doing scientific work. Actually, I don't do any medical work anymore. I'm also a Christian and I follow Jesus and I find myself as a scientist in the church and a Christian in science. I uh, have written a book that you just pointed to called The Genealogical Adam and Eve and also founded uh, Peaceful Science, which you can find online. And that's kind of something I do on the side. I've uh, really been trying to figure out how to think about theology and faith uh, and science and all of that together. In a way that makes sense that can kind of bring us to a way to make sense of all these things together. I'm also known a bit as a critic of intelligent design. I'd like to see myself as a friendly critic. I have a lot of friends in that movement, but when it comes to some of their uh, scientific points, I've just disagreed with them. And so that's mm -hmm. what I hope will make the conversation interesting today. Right. Yeah. And that's precisely why I wanted to have you on. You are you're you're relevant experts. You are a Christian, and you are a friendly critic. And I have um, obviously I've engaged and, and read your work, and I I think you are the perfect interlocutor uh, for this conversation. So thank you for being here. So Dr. Behe, if you wouldn't mind a brief reintroduction on your end. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Mike Behe. I'm a professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University, and I too am a Christian. I'm a Roman Catholic. Was born into a Catholic family. And I never concerned myself with evolution or Darwin's theory because Catholics really didn't care about that. Uh, people <laughs> said that Thomas Aquinas had it all figured out uh, a while back. So you know, what did I care? I, uh, I got interested in evolution, though, in you know the mid 80s when I read a skeptical, skeptical book called Evolution of Theory and Crisis by a biochemist geneticist named Michael Denton, who was also a, a medical doctor too. And um, he raised a lot of things that I had never heard about in my scientific training and uh, that startled me. And so I became looking into, uh, I, I started to look into the question of who had explained all of these complex systems that you routinely come across in biochemistry and was chagrined to find that nobody had, that essentially everybody was just nodding at each other saying, yes, we understand how this came about. But if you looked in the scientific literature, you would not find that. So um, I, at that point, I became interested in evolution, especially in biochemistry, since that's my, uh, my discipline. And I've written a three books now over the decades expressing my um, doubts about Darwinian theory and my uh, contention that intelligent design is a is a better explanation for the foundation of life. Right. Very cool. Okay. So I know we didn't want to make this the focal point of the conversation. I really do want to um, drill down into the specific empirical disagreements that you two have. Uh, but um, we are coming up on an anniversary of, I guess, something of a. Well, we are in the anniversary of it. We, we are okay. Would you mind actually giving the brief explanation of that then? Because you're probably more familiar with it than I am. Yeah. So if we were to go back exactly 15 years from now, there would still be we'd be in the middle of arguments um, for the Dover trial. Uh, Mike actually probably has a better handle on precisely where we would be in the proceedings, and they would have ended, I think, November 4th, so sometime next week, or was it December 4th? About November 4th. 
and then the judge would have been going uh, into into thinking through what his uh, the opinion would be, and it would be the end of December that he would deliver the verdict on the Dover trial. This is the uh, Kilmitzer, if I pronounce that right, versus uh, the, uh, Kitz the Mil Dover, Kitz Miller. <laughs> Kitz Miller versus the Dover Education Board. And um, we just interviewed uh, Eugenie Scott uh, at Peaceful Science about that. Uh, pretty soon we're going to be interviewing Ken Miller. I asked Mike if he would let me interview him, and he said no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which is a real bummer because we were really wanting to to kind of get some views from different sides. Both both Ken Miller, who's the author of Miller and Levine uh, biology textbook, and Mike Eady were both uh, star witnesses actually at, in this trial, and uh, they were really asking, uh, you know, without getting into too many of the messy details, you know, what is going to be the place of ID within high school education, and they decided um, in a in a way that very understandingly, a lot of people in the ID movement are going to contest. I'm just trying to explain what happened, right? Uh, that 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 wasn't going to work. Uh, what they wanted to do right then, and so that's kind of the history. That was 15 years ago. Um, I think it was uh, widely appreciated. I think to be a, a even in the ID movement to be really not a good thing for ID, and that's not what they wanted to happen. And uh, and you know, it's, it's interesting to look at what's happened to the ID movement since then, and, and maybe even uh, you know, Mike can give us some clues about that as well. How would you add to that story? I tried to be as like uh, helpful oh. for people who are new to it as possible <laughs> without like hitting on any of the landmines. Well, uh, let's see. I, I would start out by recommending that uh, everybody read a particular book called *The Trial*, which was written by a man named Franz Kafka. And if you've oh, but heard that's, the, a, that's Kafka. That's not the you, actual trial. <laughs> if you've heard the word Kafka-esque, it's, it's not the Dover trial, but it sure sums up my view of it. Uh, <laughs> Kafka was, was, real, uh, was famous for thinking up these surreal situations where, uh, where the, uh, uh, you know, things uh, appear for no reason and you don't know what's going on, and, and that's what I thought of of the I trial. I see. That was your experience with it. You have so, to re you have to realize that courts are not good places to discuss ideas. They are places where lawyers try to win and lose, and lawyers want to paint the other side's witnesses as either fools or uh, knaves or both. I've written a, a summary of my uh, experience in it, which I sent to Josh in lieu of my uh, appearing on his podcast. Uh, and the main point that I make is that there is no evidence that the judge understood any of the uh, academic testimony that was presented at the trial. You have to remember this opinion was written by an English major from uh, Dickinson University and who was a lawyer and a uh, failed politician and a, uh, a, the uh, appointed head of the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board. And whenever he wrote about the academic side of the trial, that is about the biochemistry, me and Ken Miller, theology, uh, paleontology, and so on. He copied the text that was handed to him uh, from the lawyers for the plaintiffs, which I don't know for sure, but uh, looking at the phrases, almost certainly was not written by the lawyers, but by uh, Eugenie Scott and her folks can, I, can I respond to that not not yet please okay sure national center for science education and there is no so essentially he just signed off what on already was their argument and uh there is no evidence to show that he understood any of these concepts so yeah it's a legal win it has force and so on you know it's defensible as uh, as whether or not a particular idea or a particular school board erred in trying to get something put into the school curriculum. But as a, an intellectual matter, 
as some sort of judgment on either Darwinism or design or anything in biology, it has, you know, uh, it has no value. Yeah. So, so I know, again, I want to make sure that we don't spend too much time on this because our time is limited, but Josh definitely want to hear your response to that. And then, um, well, first of all, I think, um, it was interesting because I just talked to Eugenie Scott on Saturday and that's online right now. Um, first of all, I think actually we'd all agree that a legal trial is not the right place to adjudicate scientific issues. I think we'd all agree. It was interesting. I asked them at the end, Nathan Lentz and Eugenie Scott, you know, in, you know, if you imagine a world, maybe like 10 or 15 years from now, right, he's gotten rid of all of his bad arguments and it's actually made a strong case that's solid, that's convinced a large number of scientists. Would that prevent it from being caught in high schools? I mean, would that, would, would that, I mean, like that, that, that actual uh, finding and they actually said, well, I mean, this is kind of like a fantasy world, but if that actually happened, then actually, yeah, that wouldn't stop it. That that would actually really help. So, so I think what they're saying, which I think you're agreeing with, is that actually how scientists see this in the end is going to be far more important than how um, lawyers see it. That's the first thing. Second thing is, I mean, I've talked to lawyers about this, and it turns out now this is something that's outside my expertise because I'm not a lawyer. It's outside your expertise too because you're not a lawyer. But it turns out that it's actually very common for uh, for uh, judges to uh, to just copy from from one of the sides, the side that they're agreeing with. So what they're trying to do is just judge which of the sides they're doing. And a really good written case will have a lot of, a really good uh, brief given by one side will actually have a lot of quotes. So that's not actually an indication of anything. I wouldn't have known that, honestly, unless I'd actually talked to some lawyers. And we were discussing other cases as well. But, um, but you're right, though, because he's not an expert to adjudicate this. But I do think that there's a couple facts that I think you would agree with, Mike. I think you would agree, tell me if I'm right, I think you would agree that the majority of biologists uh, um, are not on the same page with you on your arguments. They disagree with the argument you made. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, yes, of course I do. And I've said so in all of my books. Yeah. I pointed out that this is a, a new idea and I laid out my arguments. So whether they agree with me or not is not the question in my mind. Yes, it's I agree. Whether, it's whether they have a response to my arguments or not. Well, and well, well, I haven't seen say anything. That, I'm just trying to focus on the common ground. I think we agree that, and then that fact doesn't mean you're wrong because maybe everyone else is wrong and you're right. So that's not, I'm not making an appeal to authority. I'm just saying as a fact, right. the majority of biologists disagree with you and, and we can assess that differently, right? And it does seem to me that um, if you're gonna take, you know, kind of a policy point of view, what should be taught to high school students is what the majority of biologists think. And the best way to change how it's taught is change what the majority of biologists think. And I think actually if, yeah. if you know, maybe in the next 10 or 20 years, if your arguments are as strong as you think about it, Mike, you know, maybe you would convince all of them and that would change everything. So I do think that he was probably qualified and correctly assessed that the majority of biologists disagreed and that's the case, right? Well, I, I think that's a, a, a kind of naive, simplistic view. I don't mean any disrespect by that. Um, scientists not only assess evidence, they have a worldview. They, they like to look at things in a particular way. And at the trial, although I, I don't want to talk, talk about this trial and I don't want to talk about you know, what gets in schools or not, I don't care. Okay. I, homeschool, I homeschool my kids. So what do I care? What <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so do I. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and I, I definitely want to get to the arguments too. So let's just have yeah, like I one final- talk about whether it's true or not. Yeah, well, so let's have uh, one final word on it and then we'll move on. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the point I want to make is that if you look through the history of science, it's real easy to find a number of places where the entire scientific community thought something was correct and it turned out to be wrong. There's also not too hard to find uh, ideas, new theories that seem to have religious implications. And scientists didn't like them simply because of that. And I talked about the Big Bang theory extensively in the Dover trial to illustrate that point. And because it was not written into the opposing lawyer's document, uh, the judge did not copy that into his opinion. Nonetheless, in the, with the, when the Big Bang Theory was first uh, proposed, 
it seemed to smack or seemed to many scientists to smack of creation and and so on and a number of them explicitly said that science needs an eternal universe and the claim that the universe had a beginning is not scientific so um, scientists are not Mr. Spock. They're not uh, just logic machines. And even social aggregations of scientists, scientific organizations, are not uh, just logic machines either. They have their own way that they want the world to be, and they can resist uh, I ideas quite strenuously if it goes against what they expect. Okay. So, um, so we are in a in a relevant anniversary, and that's good that we we acknowledge that to begin with. But let's yeah, let's turn to the to the thing that I think most people are interested in. Um, is it true, right? Are are, are the critiques? Um, and I I understand that intelligent design is sort of an umbrella term, and there's there's you know different people hold hold different criticisms, I suppose. So I want to focus on your work specifically, Doctor Behe, because you're on the podcast. So <laughs> would you um would you give us just a a a brief sketch. Uh, I know that um, Dr. Swamidas is familiar with with your work, but just for the audience, what is the the criticism in a nutshell? And then let's let's just let's just drill down and, and dive in from there. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let me just quickly say what uh, why we conclude intelligent design. Uh, intelligent design, or something resembling it, was pretty much you know universally thought to be true before Charles Darwin. And it wasn't a religious conclusion, rather uh, people, philosophers, natural, natural philosophers looked at the world and they saw regularity and they saw really impressive structures and they looked at the heavens and the stars and so on. And they thought these things are arranged for life on earth. And it turns out that when we see things that seem to be arranged, that seem to have a purpose, that's when we conclude that, hey, maybe these were purposely done. Maybe these are the result of intelligent design. In 1859, of course, Jar Darwin published his, uh, his book, Origin of Species, where he said, yeah, no, 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 yeah, that those look designed, but I have a different explanation. I think there's a an overlooked natural process that can explain for the, can explain that, and that's random mutation or random variation in natural selection, and that won over people over the years. Uh, but in Darwin's time, they didn't know about molecules. They didn't. They thought the cell was a fairly simple little thing. And since then, science has discovered that the foundation of life, the cell, is enormously complex. It contains very sophisticated machinery and much, much else that I've written about in a couple of my books. And in the meantime, that means that the problem for Darwinism, random mutation and natural selection, has grown larger and larger because now not only does it have to explain eyeballs and wings and so on, it has to explain this molecular structure of life. And I have written in my books why I think it cannot. And I have used that old argument, the same old argument of the purposeful arrangement of parts to say, hey, at the foundation of life, there's an incredible, uh, incredibly strong purposeful arrangement. So that's the gist of it. As far as I can see, the critique, uh, and of course, Josh will <laughs> correct me here, but uh, the critique is a, a couple of things. Number one, you're not allowed to invoke design because we say that's not scientific. Number two, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the future, Darwinism will be shown to be able to explain those things, even if it can't now. Or number three, in the future, some other idea will be shown to explain it. Those are the chief ones in my experience. Okay. So Josh, why don't you come back now and is, are there, um, because I, just to give people a little bit of background, you um, co-authored one of the initial published responses, critical responses to Dr. Behe's latest book. So um, 
you say that you disagree with um, his scientific evaluation on certain points. So yeah, why don't you why don't you come back now and, and yeah, and to be clear, he's written three books. I mean, I've, I've read both. I mean, all three of them very closely. So that response was to Darwin Duvall's, but uh, what uh, Mike just discussed right now was uh, maybe his more closely related to his first book, uh, which I can talk about as well. But but let me just start by saying that um, that he talked about the conclusion that he has that everything's intelligently designed. And you know, I just want to say in that large conclusion, I actually agree. I share that worldview. I think that, I, and I would even go farther to say it was divinely designed. Um, I would say that God designed it all. I think that God created us everything. Uh, he did it intentionally. And in that sense, he designed everything. So any of the disagreements we have here are not actually about that conclusion. Mm -hmm. I actually agree with that conclusion. And it's not about worldview because I'm, I'm in that same worldview. The, the difference really has to do about whether or not the argument being made is sound. And that's, that's, a, that, that's the nature of the agreement, a disagreement here. Because I can actually, I do actually agree on that ultimate conclusion. And I, I even publicly articulate that as a, I did that even as a non-tenured scientist that I think God designed us all. I think he created everything. And so uh, I've been willing to take risks in my career to say that publicly. So that's not what the debate is about. It's not about whether or not God actually designed things. It's rather whether or not the specific argument being made against it makes any sense. Does, does that does, does that clarify a little bit? And I can explain it it does for now. me. And, and maybe we could even use me as something of a case study. So, so um, Josh, I know this is the first time that we spoke, so I don't assume you know anything about me, uh, nor is it all that interesting. But I was I was an atheist for a while. Um, and I became a theist predominant, predominantly, if not exclusively, because of the philosophical arguments for God and, and the soul and stuff like that. Evolution was something that I just sort of assumed as part of my educational upbringing. Um, my background is philosophy. It's not science. Um, so I, I, I just had no reason to ever really question it, right? When I became a theist, same thing. I, I saw it as sort of – I had to you know, clear up a few things here. Okay, is this compatible? Especially as I became a Christian with with Adam and Eve and stuff like that. And uh, I wish your work was around a little bit sooner. Might have might have helped me sooner on that question. Um, but yeah, once the once the worldview switched for me, evolution still wasn't like a huge. It wasn't like a big hang up for me, right? Like it just it just wasn't. And I will say it still isn't in a sense, right? So, um, and the reason I bring me up is because um, I I just never really took much of a look at. Uh, the intelligent design movement, even as I was kind of moving from from atheism to theism, because it just didn't seem of, of pressing concern to me. However, curiosity gets the better of me. Um, and especially I start to see a very let's we can all be honest, there's been a very vitriolic reaction to, to a lot of this work, not not all of it, but some well, of it has been to be clear, it's been mutually vitriolic, right? So yeah, not, so not every individual person, but there's a lot of animosity from mainstream scientists towards ID. Right. There's also a lot of animosity from a lot of ID people towards mainstream science. It's kind of like a, it's a, it's kind of a mutually uh, messy thing. I mean, Mike is largely kind yeah. of stayed above the fray, and I also have too. Yeah, but... yeah, and, and that's exactly what I want to have you two discuss because it's. Right. So it's you have to keep in mind that there are organizations that uh, are work to uh, stop intelligent design being discussed to stop intelligent design books from being published or papers being published. Uh, and so there, you know, while you know, some people in each side might be uh, chill and mellow and others might be vitriolic, it's an uneven uh, asymmetric battle here because uh, the organized power, the organized uh, um, the organized centers are all on the uh, Darwinian side. So um, we can we can circle back back to that um, because I think that is an important maybe social factor. It's worth considering. But the point I'm driving is that as I actually read Dr. Behe's work and then I read the critiques uh, by by Ken Miller or something like that as a non-specialist, which I admit in that field, I at least came away with the impression of okay, there's there's at least something more here than my initial impression was that there's a, there is there is a case right whether it's an ultimately successful case i'm not sure but it definitely wasn't deserving of the the hand-waving dismissals that i just assumed by relevant experts was the case before so i've become um 
I call myself something of a of a of a friendly advocate for at least discussion around this. Um, so you know, I guess that kind of situates me in, in an interesting, maybe makes me somebody who hopefully can can moderate discussions like this fairly, just given where I was and and how I kind of entered into this. So with that being said, as somebody you know, for me, um, Josh, who's 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 read his arguments, who's read the criticisms. Where do you think his argument fails? Is like on the empirical level, right? Because I get all the philosophical considerations of the boundaries and science and this and that, and those are important questions. They are. That's that. That well, is good. I mean, but, we, we have to be very clear here. That Mike has made several arguments, and it, you, I can't really talk about them broadly very well. So we can talk about individual ones. So I'll talk about the one that, he, that he's just mentioned here. So first of all, there's actually a large part of what he said that I agree that I agree with. So uh, he stated that uh you know that he's with his conclusion that everything's designed and i even went a step further and said i think it's actually designed by god he doesn't do that in his argument but i think that that is exactly what we should say okay um i think he says I, 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 correctly I, I, that if i could just say i i don't say that everything is designed as a matter of fact i don't think that everything was designed in the fact of being explicitly intended by god even though i am a theist I think there's stuff, you know, uh, there are uh, non-intended side effects of many things. Uh, so, no, I, I you know, I, I have run across a number of folks like yourself, Josh, who do think that uh, everything was intended by God. But No, no, I didn't say it was I everything disagree. is intended. Um, so this is getting to theology and like uh, systematic theology. I think we're just struggling with language because we're biologists and not theologians. I'd rather not go down that rabbit trail. I mean, I, except for, for to say that I'm just articulating the doctrine of creation, that God created all things. I think that you agree to. Okay. And, and if that's what we mean by God designed all things, which I think you agree to. So maybe you mean something different and God intended this particular thing. Now, uh, now, let's be clear. I agree with that part. I think I think it's just a language issue between theology and science we're dealing with. Maybe not, but we can work that out later. The other part that I really agreed with, he says that in general, that when we see the purposeful arrangement of parts, that it seems to indicate design to us. And that's and the way how you know Doug Axe would put it, which I would agree with, is that it's a design intuition. He's not an ID supporter, but Alan Planago would call it a design discourse. He, and I think that, that there's something that that's actually what's so strong about his argument and correct because it kind of brings you into direct, you know, visual appreciation of the beauty of God's creation. And it's kind of written on our hearts. And, you know, Doug Axe would kind of it goes much deeper into this. And I think correctly that, you know, we just naturally respond to think, oh, this is beautiful. And we worship God with it. Right. I think that's completely correct. You know, when we um, when we were, uh, right, giving that, it, that, but that's that's not at all what I care about. I, I know, but I, I'm telling you the part I agree with. Okay, <laughs> well, you, you can't agree with me on that because I'm I have some significant disagreements with it. You're you're attributing to me some things I don't actually believe. I, as I okay. said, I was I was taught evolution in parochial schools and so on, and I, I thought you know that's fine. Uh, I did not have any objection to evolution on religious or theological grounds. Okay. It was strictly on scientific. Oh, I believe you. I believe you. I'm just using Christian language and explaining why yeah. I agree with the things that you said. You said that we recognize design by purposeful arrangement of parts. And I'm agreeing with you on that. And I'm explaining why I agree with you on that. And the reasons might be different than yours. But uh, is that okay for me to agree with you for different reasons? <laughs> okay, I guess so. <laughs> All right. Wow, it's so hard to agree with you, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now where does the problem come? So the problem is that how do you break that down into a scientific argument that actually, um, you know, works by the rules of science? And I'm not talking about methodological naturalism. And I'm not even going to bring into the issue about, you know, design, design versus that, divine design versus that. I mean, I think there's some theological uh, critiques that we made, but we can just leave that all aside. Um, I, I, when you get into the details of these arguments, the, the definitions that are often used are not applied consistently uh, with enough rigor for it to work. Uh, in uh, even if you take it out of design, like if, if I did, if I made a similar argument having nothing to do with design, and used uh, and and did those moves in the argument, I'd have a lot of problems. I wouldn't be able to get my paper published. 
Um, and I know that because I've, I've been, a, I, you know, I've been struggling to get a lot of papers published over the last, you know, 10 years. And so when I look at that, it's, and, you know, and, you know, before this call, I was on, on a phone call for an hour actually talking with one of my collaborators. And we were debating what we actually meant by a specific word because it was creating a great deal of confusion across disciplines. And we needed to make sure that in our argument, we were actually applying it in a very consistent way that made sense. And we weren't, and it was creating a lot of confusion and we were really concerned about this. Paper. Okay, could you give a, could so you give a specific happened, example? Think, uh, and what has happened, I think it, this has been happening a lot, especially in the irreducible complexity argument. And it's, there certainly came up in Darwin Duvall's as well too, is that there tends to be critical um, concepts that are defined in ways that are not consistently applied. Such as? In ways that really undermine the argument. Um, from an evidential point of view. And as scientists, we're really trained to kind of hone in and understand okay. those. Can you give and, an example? And so that's, <laughs> let, me, let me just finish talking, Michael, you talk. And so that, that's kind of where my, just my, uh, my professional mindset kicks in. I want to know, what is that? And when I've looked over the history of it in several key terms, for example, irreducible complexity, I can show actually how, uh, I mean, I saw is a better way to put it, how, uh, how Mike, very well-meaning, well -meaning, I'm sure, actually shifted definitions over time in a way that um, as a scientist trained in academic ar argumentation like this, I just, it, just, it just raised red flags. When I looked into it closer and I tried to make the argument work, um, I, I just couldn't because uh, that, that shifts, those shifts end up being really important to making it seem on the surface like a strong argument, but at the lower level, it just isn't. So go ahead, sorry, Mike. That was just my assessment and maybe I'm wrong. You can convince me different. Well, uh, I note in your talk that you didn't refer to any example that I talked about in Darwin's Black Box. You didn't refer to any example I talked about in other books. You just said kind of vaguely that all oh, definitions shifted and you didn't even give the definition. So you haven't actually <laughs> said anything substantial in the in the uh, the example in Darwin's black box to get across the idea of irreducible complexity. And like Josh, uh, maybe unlike Pat, I'm not a philosopher. So uh, I uh, write you know as as precisely as I can. Uh, but the definition of, or the example of irreducible complexity I gave, for a broad audience was a mouse trap, a mechanical mouse trap, where you have a, uh, a wooden base and a spring and a hammer and all these things. And I, I said, if you take one of the parts away, it doesn't work anymore. And I said that that's a problem for a, an evolutionary pathway such as Darwin would propose because if you because random mutation and selection depends on improving things stepwise in tiny steps. And it's real hard to see how you can make even a simple mousetrap by numerous successive slight modifications as Darwin in his book, The Origin of Species demanded. Uh, and as a matter of fact, to my satisfaction, nobody has been able to explain even that in the 25 years. Hey, let's talk about since... mouse traps. I'd like to talk about that. Okay, in just a second, I'd be happy to. In, uh, in 25 years, nobody has been able to explain that, let alone the scientific examples I gave. Perhaps the best known uh, of those is, say, the bacterial flagellum, which uh, everyone here knows, but perhaps some of the listeners won't know that. Uh, it's an outboard motor that bacteria use to swim. And it's phenomenally complex. Uh, it's clearly a machine. Uh, and it's also irreducibly complex. If you don't have the tail, the propeller, if you don't have the motor, if you don't have a number of different parts, it doesn't work. And it, it's real hard to see how that could be put together uh, step by gradual step. And what's more, as I reiterate in my newest book, Darwin Devolves, ever since the first book came out, people railed against it, but there has been no progress. There have been no scientific papers published which demonstrate or even come close to demonstrating that random mutation and natural selection could build such a, an intricate 
uh, machine. So um, that's the problem that I want to hear about. That's the uh, critical claim. Darwin's theory, uh, a lot of Darwinists say that the important thing about Darwin's theory is that it showed that design in biology is an illusion. So I, I want to respond, but if design. you put too many things on the table, it just gets confusing. I mean, yeah, it's well, good, okay, you know, please do then. Put some good ideas out there I'd like to respond to, but if you keep on going, I can't actually, you know, engage. Unless you don't want to, if you want to just kind of, I mean, I'm happy actually if you want to keep on going. There's just two points I want to make. Um, and then I want to go back. I mean, there's one point I want to make about that last point you made, and then go back to the very first point about the, um, about the mousetrap. Um, so first off, uh, I'd actually say that most informed biologists would agree with you that Darwin's theory does not explain what we see. That's actually uh, kind of irrelevant because modern evolutionary science cares about a lot more than just random mutation and natural selection. There's quite a large number of things that are more important. And when we start to think about molecular evolution, you know, there's a lot of non-Darwinian processes that become important. So that type of language, I think, ends up being perhaps well-intentioned, but ultimately misleading because, yeah, we already agree with that point. If that's your point, that's actually been really well-established since I think when you were in high school, Mike. So I think that, you know, I think that, you know, uh, I mean, I think you were in the high school in the 60s, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So during, and since the 60s, that's actually been very well appreciated by anyone informed about this. So, so yeah, we agree with that, but that's kind of leaves the entire point beside the point because we so, don't so, care about Darwin's theory. We care so, about how evolutionary science is understood. That's so Josh, point. just just for the audience who aren't familiar, what, what would be an example of something that is a non-Darwinian process? So uh, there's a large number of, of things that are non-Darwinian. One example that I've given um, is is neutral processes. Uh, so for example, one of the things found out in the 60s, so I'm pointing to Kimura's work. So Haldane, I mean, actually I learned about Haldane and Haldane's dilemma from reading creationist literature <laughs> um, and how he said there's not enough time to fix all the exchanges that we've seen uh, and to do that. There were, uh, and and that, that was a point he made and he was correct mathematically. I heard about the dilemma from creationists, but I didn't hear about the solution until I actually looked at the, what you know the literature actually said is you know a few years later, uh, Kimura showed that actually the majority of, uh, of fixation events or how the changes are not caused by selection. They're totally independent of selection or largely independent is a better way. And what do they build? What? Do they build a flagellum? That's a different question. I, I, I can make well, it. I, I, I don't want to change the topic. That's the I mean, question I'm interested point. in. <laughs> so, the, so, so does that single thing explain it? No, it's an interaction of a very large number of mechanisms. But if you are reductive to say, does that one thing explain it? Of course not. There's, there's no one thing that explains it. It's going to be a complex interaction of many things. And if you leave out any one important mechanism, you can't, no one would expect to explain it. So to say that I don't think that X plus Y can explain that when we know that A, B, C, D, E, F, and Z are important too, is kind of like a strange mm -hmm. argument to make. I mean, it's a very, very strange argument to make. Okay. I, That's the first I, I, thing, but I want to go back to the mousetrap. You put too many things on the table before, okay? So then I think it gives a really good illustration of the point I made about shifting definitions and what, why this ends up being really critical. So for um, selection to be an important process, there's got to be some sort of function that's being improved upon. And he's right about that. I already told you that selection isn't the only way things can be made. But if you looked at what he said, he says, if you take any one part away, he means the, the spring, if you take that away, if you take the base away, if you take the trap part of it away, and if you maybe take the trigger part of it away, I don't know. I mean, depending how you make these, maybe it could be like three to five different parts, right? Uh, then the overall function of the mousetrap stops working. And he's right. But here's, here's where the wiggle word comes in. And um, I'm not the first person to point this out. Um, a Draper uh, is a philosopher when, who wrote uh, a very long explanation of this. And when Alvin Plantinga, a Christian, read this, this is actually what really changed his view of, of, uh, of intelligent design. Uh, the point is that, uh, that you know, each of those individual parts could have had other functions. And actually biologists have been saying for, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert historian, but I know at least since I was in college and you know, I think you can even trace this stuff back over 150 years ago to you know Darwin's book, actually, ironically. But I mean, this has been a constant idea. The word is acceptation. The idea is that some a part would be, I mean, part of it might be developed for some reason, and then it gets co-opted 
or XAPT it to be used for another process. And to really be able to tell if something can evolve uh, by you know, evolutionary mechanisms, broadly speaking, you really have to have a comprehensive view of not only its current function, but its past functions. Now, the, you know, I don't know anyone, frankly, who has uh, not even evolutionists that have a good handle of that on complex cases. Now, I mean, we have some hints and, and clues into it, but you can't make a strong claim about it's not involved unless you have that handle. So it seems to be then um, an argument that's really based on, uh, on uh, you know, either a misunderstanding or a silencing or whatever, uh, or, or, you know, a misuse. I don't know how to explain it. Maybe you can clarify, Mike. I mean, I don't think, it, I don't think it's really, I think it's kind of misleading to give that example when several other people have pointed out uh, this issue of acceptation. You don't have to, you, you, just the fact that you take away one part here doesn't mean that it can't evolve. You also have to show that each of the things couldn't have been involved individually, individually and then come together later. And now you haven't done that with the mass trap. And that's like a major logical gap that other people have pointed out that, that, you know, when I see that, I just need a way, I'm just explaining you how I'm responding to it. Okay, yeah. then I'm gonna yeah. let you say, I, I, you know, when I see that, you know, I, want, I mean, I've looked very closely at your work on this and I know what some of your responses are, but I also just heard what your summary was for everyone. And also what you said, all the major critiques are, one of the major critiques is acceptation. And I was very surprised to hear that that wasn't actually in the list of the three things that you raised. Right, so just to summarize, tried for the for the non-specialist audience there might be a process out there where these these parts evolve separately and then somehow i'm not going to attempt to make a guess of how that would be they came together and coordinated to serve a different function right that's that's generally kind of what we're, we're, we're discussing. Yeah, and if you look at how design works from even how human design may, may i jump in at some not point designing things from scratch we start yeah. with the things we put them together so go ahead yeah, so yes please mike respond to all that yep okay um Josh, uh, I, I can't believe that you read the work closely because I addressed all those issues starting from Darwin's black box in each of my books and in blog posts, papers, and all sorts of well, other know, things that. besides. Uh, so when you say that uh, you don't understand how I can give this example, how can you object to it if you haven't read my uh, responses I did for your them. work. What then I said is I objected to tell how you the audience here about I said that. Objected how you presented me, it here. In, the, in, the, in Darwin's black box, I says, okay, well, suppose you want to make something like a mousetrap. And so you go into the garage and what, here's, a, here's a, uh, a, a, um, a tire iron that maybe you'll use as the, as the, uh, as the uh, holding bar. And, and here's a spring from a grandfather clock. Maybe you can use that as the spring for the mousetrap. And I said, but it's clear that you can't use those parts unless they are matched to each other. So saying that this one part arose for some other purpose, and yet we can use it for some other complex purpose without uh, adjusting it uh, is, is a, not a serious uh, proposal. I also wrote that we don't have to talk abstractly about these things. A lot of evolutionary experiments have been done in the past uh, 25 years or so. For example, I, my second book was about the development of chloroquine resistance to malaria. And I don't have time to get into the specifics, but there was an enormous number of malaria parasites in the world, an astronomical number, 10 to the 20th or more, uh, many, many, many more than the number of, say, vertebrates that exist in the world. And yet, when they were challenged with this lethal drug, chloroquine, they could have done anything they wanted to. They could have, you know, ex uh, exapted something. They could have duplicated some genes. They could do anything. And yet at the end, when people determined how they had developed resistance to this drug chloroquine, there were two little point mutations in a pre-existing protein. More recently, uh, I talk in my book about experimental laboratory evolution and almost uniformly, I should say uniformly, <laughs> it's due to either the breaking or rearranging of 
pre-existing genes. There is no acceptation to make something new, certainly nothing of the complexity of the systems that I talked about. But isn't rearranging existing stuff to make something new, isn't that actually literally the definition of acceptation? How is that not acceptation? Well, there is no example, the only example that is- You said even rearranging, I'm just confused on a, on a language level. I mean, I'm honestly confused. You said nothing well, except it, for the breaking it, or rearrangement of existing parts, but a rearrangement okay. is acceptation. Uh, no, no, it isn't. Acceptation, okay, what's the difference? acceptation means you use, say, the, uh, the spring from the grandfather clock in so your garage. So we rearrange it from the, the grandfather spring, clock. Into this new as thing. the spring for the mousetrap. You can't say it's acceptation if you have to take something or something that looks like something else and extensively modify it uh, to get it to work. So, really? for example, okay. I'm not so, familiar with this definition. Well, read read the books. I mean, <laughs> read I've, read, I've read the books very closely. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a biologist who's studied right. evolutionary science very closely. In any in any event, in the, in the best laboratory evolution experiments that uh, was done, uh, no new uh, molecular machines were seen in Richard Lenski's experiments with E. coli. As a matter of fact. The overwhelming number of mutations broke pre-existing genes, and that helped. And let me just add just one more point, and then I'll turn over the microphone. Uh, Josh says that you know most biologists know that Darwin's theory, Darwin's mechanism, isn't the only thing. I certainly know that too. But his two co-authors of my book. Uh, uh, of the review of my book that appeared in Science Magazine. Nathan Lentz and argues, Richard Lentz. Yes, argues strongly uh, for Darwinian principles. Richard Lenski is a, a very strong Darwinist. So there are, and I, I disagree with, uh, with Josh. I think the uh, majority of biologists, when they think of evolution, think of Darwinian processes. There are some who don't, but they haven't much made their case either. I mean, that's interesting. Um, I mean, Nathan's a good friend of mine, actually. We, we've talked about his lessons. I also talked to uh, Lenski about it too, but um, they know how I see this and they didn't actually have any scientific objections to what I was saying. I mean, maybe it's just different ways of expressing the same idea, I don't know. But I mean, we can let go of the precise term acceptation. You're saying that new functions can be arise out of rearranging existing parts. So that's, if that's what you think, I mean, that's what I mean when I say acceptation. And so that's pretty interesting that you think that that can happen too. But not, not by chance, not without purposeful direction. I mean, if you, if you're talking about rearranging, say bones from a leg into bones for a flipper, which was one of the examples that you and your co-authors used in uh, the review of my book, you can't say that these bones were just exapted and hey, now they're a flipper. There's lots and lots of things, intermediate steps, including lots and lots of molecular steps, which would have to take place. It strikes me that the phrase exaptation is being used as a but magic see, it, sounds, wand it sounds like that you're kind of making to... the case for the evolutionists, though, because you're saying that there's a lot of intermediates that, that would be there. So if so, if there's a lot of intermediates between point A and point B, that actually makes the story more plausible. I'm a, I'm not sure I. So yeah, maybe I can I can just it. jump in here just because um, I see yeah I can see the initial um plausibility of saying well hey yeah we have these different parts and and we could and maybe they could come together and, and coordinate to a new function now I, i'll be honest that that does sound a little bit magical to me uh, again i'm a layman so i'm not saying that that's an argument against it but that would be that would be pretty fantastic um however once i, I i've again i'm not i'm not a molecular biologist but when i when i've read when i've read the work and i've seen the examples of these molecular machines they seem they're not the type of thing, let me say it this way, they're, they seem very efficient, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong there, but they seem very well. Some of them well, are, yeah, not yeah, all of them, but very, some of them are. Right, 
and if and if the if the process were really something of grabbing this part and this part that wasn't originally intended to coordinate to some larger thing, I would probably expect not things that are quite efficient, right? Well, like maybe clunky or you're working yeah. from like a particular model in mind, but but I'd say biology is somewhat that, but it's also something else too. Like another um, word picture to throw in there would be something like Legos. Um, so, so and it's not a perfect analogy, but let me just show you, give you some evidence behind that. Like if you look at chimpanzees and humans, we have essentially the same pieces. Um, there's slightly different interaction networks. Um, there's slightly different point mutations. Um, Mike even agrees that there's no, uh, uh, that there's no molecular machines that humans have that chimpanzees don't. And that there's no, and yeah, that but, there's no- but that, that doesn't explain where no they biochemical from. evidence <laughs> But but that doesn't explain where where they came from. Even no, if you're using even if you're if you're using that to try true. to argue for common descent between chimps and humans, I don't care about common descent. But, but, but that's I'm not, I'm I not only arguing. care about whether the molecular machinery required purposeful design or not. No, that I didn't. This isn't an argument against purpose. This is rather making the statement that all the differences between us and chimpanzees to first approximation, that's not the complete story, but it's a very big part of the story, is just, you know, slight rearrangement of parts. Um, and that creates a very large difference between us and them. And I think God was involved in human evolution, so I'm not saying it's not purposeful and God didn't do it. I'm, I'm just saying that quite a bit can be done, mm -hmm. uh, you know, stuff that we wouldn't expect. And, and it fits a little bit more the Lego analogy in that case. Uh, that, that's all I'm saying. It's a limited okay. point. It's not an argument against God's involvement. That would be silly because I'm not arguing okay. against God's involvement. All right, let, uh, let me <laughs> let, let me just make two short points. The Lego analogy I really like. I really like, but you have to realize that Legos are put together by intelligent agents, uh, and they don't assemble themselves. Uh, the second thing is that you think that God was involved with the development of humans. How would you convince Nathan Lentz, your co-author on uh, the review of my book, that that's a, uh, a reasonable conclusion? Would well, you I'd start by agreeing with you. I'd start by agreeing with you. All three of us are in agreement that there is no biochemical case to be made for design in human evolution. All three of us agree with that. I would also agree you see evidence for common descent from chimpanzees. We all agree with you. You, me, and him all agree. So how am I going to make the case that was got involved? Um, well, I would want to make that case. And but but uh, let me just start with that common ground. That common ground builds a lot of trust. I hope I'm not misrepresenting you, but I think you actually agree with me on that. You, I mean, most of your evidence comes from bacterial systems and you know yeast systems and you know malaria and all that. But in human evolution, you don't think that you can actually look and tell. So, but that doesn't mean God wasn't there and God didn't do something, right? It just you know, it just means yeah. that, that that those arguments are harder to make when you're looking at that distinction. I understand. Yeah, and I, I address that specifically in Edge of Evolution. Yes, yeah, so this is a part I, of like major common ground, man. So let me let's, let me agree with you. All no, right. I, I I said that <laughs> there aren't any biochemical, but there certainly are behavioral and intellectual profound differences between uh, yes, people and primates. And, and that I, would tell I you said that, that some of these that are, I, I are said also mystery. That there's no reason to think that Darwinian processes or other unguided, on, man. You're not even letting me agree with you. And I'm trying to ask me how uh, to convince you're going off to something else. You're telling me how you, your point of view, you want me to know how I'm going to convince him. Um, so I'm telling you, like, that's a massive place of con on ground that you actually have with Nathan Lentz. And I have with him too, okay? And so, you know, let's just start with that common ground. And the next thing I would do is tell him the exact way I came to believe that. I would tell him that I encountered Jesus, saw the evidence that he rose from the dead. I came to believe and trust him. I came to trust scripture when I see what scripture teaches about humans. And it seems to make a great deal of sense that was God is involved when you look at how different we are from other animals, even though we're so continuous with them. That paradox is a puzzle that has to be worked out. And you know, th this is something that scientists have been grappling with for a while, what, uh, for a long time. And I think there are evolutionary accounts of it, but I'm not satisfied that any of them are the whole story. And so I don't have to disagree with any of those evolutionary accounts to say that maybe there's more to it. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially, you know, your position, Mike. And I think that's a strong position. Uh, I'm, I don't think we have the same position. I, I am looking for, uh for physical biological evidence 
that a some transformation or some uh, biological feature biological feature required uh, purposeful design. I don't think you're doing that. What what feature between chimps and humans would you tell Nathan Lentz led you to believe that God was involved in making one from the other? Well, what I, I think I'm using evidence in a different way because I can definitely point to very subjective pieces of evidences about our differences. I don't think, I mean, I think humans are, uh, you know, exceptional or, I mean, I don't want to say unique precisely, but there's something very different about us and a very, um, it's, it's a way it's hard to characterize, like what it means to be human. It, you know, I don't think if, anim I mean, like if aliens came to earth, they'd be wondering, well, you know, you know, what does it mean to be a dog? I think they'd be wondering like, what's different about humans? They're not gonna be wondering about what's different about cows or all that. They're gonna be wondering about what's different about humans. I think I think that's objective. I think it's a little bit hard for scientists to appreciate that. You know, he's written a book called Not So Different where he gets into how we're very similar. And I would actually agree, we are far more similar than most people realize, but we're also far more different. And you know, language is a great example of that. I mean, you're a Catholic, you talk about the rational soul. Um, that's a very solid reason. I mean, there's something that's happened. I mean, even Chomsky, who was not a Christian, you know, you know, really argue that there had to be a large step change in our yeah. language capacity. All that's there. Now, none of that proves that evolutionary mechanisms couldn't do it. But what we do know is that we have an N of one. N of one is a statement that we say as scientists, where we just have one example of a species. You know, if you look at great apes, we all started out at about the same place. And there's maybe like three species, uh, sorry, four species of, you know, apes slash humans alive today. Um, and right. well, I, 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 I just this with is, human condition. That should great. be a puzzle. I my the final chapter of my last book, Darwin Devolved, was exactly about the differences in intelligence, in in uh, rationality, and so on between humans and other creatures. And I argued explicitly. I'm sure you remember that uh, Darwinism can't account for that. And if you deny you have a real mind, as many Darwinists well, I mean, let's just do, slow down a bit to say then you lose account. your grip on reality. But let, let me, let me um, just, so let me, I, just... I, I just want to mention that I have considered all of these topics and um, but look, I just want to explain different that this is a strong philosophical argument to consider, or like a suggestive thing, but it's not actually an airtight scientific argument. There's particular rules in science, and this doesn't actually satisfy it. It's an N of one, like I said, and I don't think that that's a problem. I just think it's something that God's put there that that's just a puzzle to, for us to figure out. I don't think science can give a complete answer to this question. So, so just to I'm sorry, finish your thought, Josh, and then I'll... Yeah, I, I don't think it can give a complete answer. I think that uh, I think that to say that all of its answers are inadequate may be true, but it's also true that there's legitimacy to some of the answers it's given. Um, so, for example, like Behe and I would both agree, Mike would both and I would agree that, you know, we share common ancestry with the great apes. That's part of the story. There's legitimacy to that, even though... I think both Mike and I would agree, and I think even Nathan Lentz would agree that that's not the whole story. And so we're, you know, we're kind of left really with a grand mystery that we're trying all trying to figure out. And is God in that mystery? I think he's not just in the mystery. He's also in the reality that we found. I mean, I think there's something very suggestive that, that God was involved. Well, right. I, I try to restrict myself just to the biology. And as I've explained in, in books and articles, uh, I think common descent is true, but I think common descent is trivial because all it says is that some ancestor in the past, past had some traits and now some descendants have it, maybe even different kinds of descendants. But it doesn't say where it came from and it doesn't say how uh, fantastic changes might have occurred in descending species. And that's particularly true with humans. Hey, maybe we have a lot of biochemical pathways and other things in common with uh, other primates but that doesn't explain where they came from in the first place, and it doesn't explain how humans have come to be the only rational species, the only uh, thinking species, the only species with a real mind uh, on the planet. So it really doesn't say 
uh, anything at all. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say anything, but I would say I, I would agree. Look, let's just be say there's there's like two extremes. It doesn't say anything. Is it? Does, it's not adequate to explain. So it does say mm -hmm. something about it. It does not explain everything. Okay, I think that's that's that seems to be a very self-evident reality. It does not explain everything. Anyone who says that evolution explains all of this is not correct. To say well, that it doesn't a, explain there, anything is just about a, as extreme. There are a large number of biologists, including, well, I, I don't want, but there are a large number of common biologists who would say, or who would lead the public to believe that in fact evolution or in particular Darwinian unguided, unintelligent well, so, processes you know, I would just say that that's not to explain all of life. I mean, depending on exactly what's being said, but if they're saying that evolution explains everything, that's not correct. I don't think the answer is to make another false claim. Right, right, Look, yeah. another way, the really good analogy that I heard from uh, one of my friends at uh, Peaceful Science, who's a scientist, is that, you know, we all believe that, you know, the American Revolution occurred, but we can't retrace the steps of every single soldier along the way. Because so when we talk about the history of the American Revolution, it's not a total history. It's only part of the story. It doesn't give us fine grained detail. And we can we can generate, um, you know, large places of large amounts of information. We can draw attention to that by just asking detailed questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the end, you know, uh, we can't really rule out that God wasn't walking among the soldiers. Like we can't rule out a lot of things that God was doing because we just have such a limited view of the past. And I think you take that analogy, and I think uh, and I think it actually works really well to explain the gaps in our biological knowledge in the past, where we can get some view about where things have happened, but we don't really know how a lot of it happened at the yeah. fine green detail of knowing how soldiers, you know, walk the paths uh, during the American I, Revolution, I, I think, order of mutations and things like that. I think, okay that. I think that's why Darwinism is such a uh, an impediment to science. Because people say, hey, you know, we don't know how something happened in the past. It's really complicated. So we'll just assume that. Oh, no, it no, no, no. That's all we do. By, we say, so now way, we're going to form hey, theories hey, about happen and test it. By the way, that, and when we do go to test it, we have to test it at the molecular level because, unlike Darwin, we now know that genetic information is encoded in a molecule and the molecular machinery is the foundational level of life. And there is no experiment that shows undirected processes can do anything like building well, you know, the molecular you know, foundation of life. I, mean, I don't want to call you Behe, Mike. It's because your name is common and your last name is Behe. I'm sorry. I mean, no disrespect. <laughs> um, but Mike, you know, here's the thing. I mean, there's no scientific way to even tell if a process is directed or not. So if, I, if we produce a pro, I mean, like, I don't know how to tell if God directed the process in my experiment or not. There's no way to do that. Mm -hmm. In the way you represent, this is actually something that I believed when I first read your book, but then I actually spent time with biologists and actually started to actually spend time and I found out it just wasn't true. It isn't that, okay, because it could happen, we don't care and we're just gonna accept it. What they do is, what we, you know, what they do is they start proposing different hypotheses and testing them. And it gets really interesting. And that's what I've really enjoyed, honestly, about studying, you know, evolutionary science literature. Not because I think evolution can explain everything, but because by that hypothesis testing approach, they're revealing parts of how God created. They're certainly never going to explain everything. I wouldn't expect anyone to be able to explain everything. That's like expecting like God-like omniscience from this very limited human effort. And, you know, as I understood it, what science really was showing us and, the, and how limited it really was, I came to see well, how actually yeah. all the people you're critiquing, Mike, about who have gone out publicly and overstated the claims of evolution, I actually agree with you on that. I think they have overstated it. I just, instead of rather making the extreme argument in the opposite way, I'd rather just kind of be more, you know, kind of take the more, uh, the part that actually acknowledges the legitimacy of both sides and maybe also kind of acknowledges kind of how both sides have overstepped and maybe more true to where the evidence okay. is really telling us. In a so, so yeah, let me hop in real, here real quick because even what you just said, Josh, would have been very surprising to me a while ago because really I was, I, well, I was under that assumption that it's taken care of. It is explained. Uh, again, not being a biology major, but having taken my biology courses in high school and stuff like that, that was the general impression that I had that I had no reason to, to really question. I'm not saying that's everybody's impression, but that was, that was mine. Right. Um, now I'm not saying your position is unreasonable. Um, but 
and it, it, we don't have to name names for people who aren't here to well, also just point out my, my view is not controversial almost. yeah or controversial i'm not saying that but the, without naming names there are popular level authors who do sure. continue to give that impression right on the They're darwinian wrong. paradigm right <laughs> and i think we all agree on that but it's important for my audience who might not have a dog in this fight this is the first time they have heard any type of uh, imp- thing on uh, who might have had a similar impression as me of of the science is settled if you even question any aspect of this you're either extremely ignorant or insane that type of rhetoric right um now i know we're running out of time here so if we have to cut this off we we, we can just cl- close the final thoughts but um arguments for conscious very interesting you know from intentionality uh, and things like that uh i think they're great i think they i think they work um that's what convinced me um but you know mike has insisted that his his case is an empirical case it's not a case from philosophy nature or something like that and i'm and that his that 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 you would argue and correct me if i'm wrong here mike that the best of the empirical evidence we have right now counts against the would you say mainstream darwinian understanding is that is that fair to say and then yes. and then maybe, not, maybe just say mainstream account instead of mainstream darwinian because we wouldn't agree with darwinian then. mainstream account i'm fine I'm, I'm fine with that the mainstream account and but the mainstream account is darwinian i disagree <laughs> uh Ter- put the terminology aside. I don't think that's going to hang us up here. Where is he uh, without getting, t- and we, we covered ex- exaptation. You, you two went back and forth on that. I guess what I would expect is if this, if the mainstream account was more robust, I guess what I would expect is more of a refutation if I'm just being honest. Um, and I'm not saying there isn't a refutation. I'm just saying from my initial impressions and reading the work and going back and forth through critiques, I have to, I have to say I'm, I'm, frequently underwhelmed by the responses of people to uh, Mike's arguments or stuff like that, that I feel like should be able to to bury this thing, quite frankly. Um, if there are, you know, have if you read it, Draper's response. I have. Yeah, I have, Draper. I, he's a look. He's a philosopher. I very much have respect. Read, um, have you read um, Planiga's response? Have yeah. So, read, Plan, so Planiga, have you where read, the where have you read you, Craig's response and why he disagrees. Have so, you, well, I don't think Craig does disagree. He, he does. I mean, I, he, not yeah, he not, not with response. not with Behe's from what I remember, and and in where the he conflict and um, and, and the, Josh, have you read my response to Draper? And, yeah, of course I have. Okay. Look, I mean, I, okay, and not only that, I'm just telling but, you. But that, hold on, real quick. Let me let, my, <laughs> let like, me finish I, my let me finish my point real quick because the last thing I read from Planig on it was in where the conflict really lies. Has there been something more recent from that on Planig? No, that's what I'm talking about. I'm also talking about Bill Craig stuff. He he recently published a, a peaceful science about this. I mean, I think that uh, you know it was on t- EPS meeting two years ago. He he explained w- where he disagreed. Like I think that um, you know and and you know. I'm just telling you that that there are that this is a big public debate where there's a lot of uninformed people engaged. There's right. also a lot of experts that are pissed off and throwing snipes at one another that are not right, there right, informed. Right. Okay, I don't think that any of that stuff really matters. Like frankly, even if everyone hates ID, but they make a solid argument, I think ultimately they're going to win the day. Yeah. And what really matters is the scientists that have respectfully engaged with them. And I think that right. you know there you know you have to actually be able to filter through a lot of really bad responses to find the good ones. I, I certainly I certainly agree with that. And that's why I, I look to people not just like Planiga, but Draper. Right. You know, so for I, example, would, I would be really curious to hear what you think about the the short series I wrote about, uh, you know, about in reducible complexity and how that addresses it. I can give you the link to that afterwards. Maybe you can post it alongside that. I've asked Mike to respond to it, but he hasn't. I mean, maybe he will. But I'd be really curious to hear how how you read that. I, mean, I wrote it to be understandable to, to someone just like you. Right. Um, I haven't read that yet, so I'm not going to speak on it, but I will I will link it. Mike, I don't know if you wanted to offer any remarks about that now or. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, it's that the uh, the machinery that I discussed in Darwin's black box is really, really impressive, the flagellum and so on. And but people like Draper and like planning and others took it to be a philosophical argument saying you can't you know, you can't rule out a pathway by which we can, you know, put this thing over there and come over and end up with this. It's supposed to be a scientific argument that this is not a good explanation for uh, for the complex machinery we got. In my most recent book, Edge of Evolution, I reduce the complexity 
down to the tiniest example of cooperation between some biochemical parts that we can. A technical term, it's called a disulfide bond. And I ask, you know, how do you get just a disul disulfide bond to evolve where it wasn't before, where maybe it might do some good? And I showed that evolutionists, Darwinists, a guy named Eugene Koonin is a prominent scientist, don't have a clue how even such a small cooperative thing could have evolved. And in my book, I also make up a new principle that I call the principle of comparative difficulty. And that says that if one thing is too hard to do, if an easier thing is too hard to do, then a harder thing is certainly going to be too hard uh, to do. If somebody can only jump three feet high, uh, given his best effort, you'd be foolish to bet money that he could jump six well, feet know, high on the next time. Uh, so Darwinists and the consensus view that uh, uh, is, that is, is I'm a often biologist. here. I'm just a sec, is just a applying sec. math to biology. That you right? often I mean, hear. Right, hold on. Let's let's let make finishing and Josh. I'll, we'll yeah. give you time to respond. Mm -hmm. Essentially, it's bluster. It's all bluster. Uh, nobody can explain the flagellum. Nobody can explain anything simpler than a flagellum. Whenever there is anything that requires cooperative interactions, that's where Darwinism and, frankly, all these other evolutionary mechanisms that uh, Josh thinks is important, that's where they all fail. Uh, I try to keep the focus on that in my book, but if Darwinists, if evolutionary biologists can't explain how a disulfide bond could arise, they can't explain pretty much anything of the molecular machinery of life. Okay. Well, I, know, I, mean, I know. I know. We're already over time. Decided, so I'm going to be very, very brief, and then we got to probably end. But yeah, and then we'll we'll do final thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'll just be very, very brief here. I mean, like, I think that's really exciting what you said, honestly, Mike, because it turns out that you know I'm a mathematical biologist. I'm a computational biologist. I learned how to do this. And what's going on here is actually just a misunderstanding on the math. And it turns out that these are actually really understandable. We can actually directly observe some of this stuff in in actual experiments. And there's something called the birthday paradox, which is kind of creating. Is that's where the math went wrong in your stuff. So um, it's the same thing that, that just arises on how likely it is that there's two people in the same room that have the same birthday. And so these sorts of things, like, you know, they're, they're very subtle. I mean, no one's, I mean, I'm not saying that you're being dishonest. Like, honestly, if you're not trained the way I was, you would just miss these things. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the sort of thing that even maybe even Kunin misses, because like, he's not a computational biologist already. And there's ways to actually make sense of this. And you just may not be familiar with that literature, and that's okay. I'm happy to get into that. And I think that's actually what's been the most exciting and what has kept me engaged in this conversation for, for so long about how, you know, it ends up pointing to really interesting science in there. And that's the part that I don't want to miss out on. Go ahead. You can kind of give us, and that could be my last thought, actually. How about that? You want to have a last thought, Mike? Yeah, so let's see. Yeah, final thoughts here, and we'll wrap this up, and, uh, and I'll make sure we also get to mention all the other work that you guys do before we say goodbye. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, just tell the listeners that, as you might expect, uh, I don't agree with Josh and, and very, very many things. He doesn't agree with me, so I would encourage everybody to read for yourself these arguments and come to your own conclusions. As I've said before, it's, often, it's been a case a number of times in the history of science that the entire scientific uh, establishment has been wrong. This is another case where they are wrong. And I try to present the, the evidence as clearly as I can. And I try to rebut the objections as clearly as I can. I, I actually have a new book coming out in a month or so called A Mouse Trap for Darwin which collects all of my responses to critics such as Josh and uh, other people over the years. So uh, if you're interested in my take on the nitty gritty of all this, that'd be a good place to start. Okay, well, I wanna thank both. This has been a spirited discussion, but I think it's been a fruitful discussion. And, Did you learn anything? Uh, yeah, yeah, hey, you know, I, I seriously, you know, honestly, that's why I have you on. I, you know, I think me along with, you know, my, my listeners, that's why we have these discussions. We just we just want to know what's true at the end of the day, right? And um, 
that's uh, and you know, if nothing else, I just feel like these discussions deserve to well be discussed, and I want to get people who I think can represent both sides uh, intelligently and charitably. So I want to thank you both for for doing that. And I like I like energy. I like a little spirit and passion in it. So I thank yeah. you both for bringing that as yeah, well. I, 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 I love I, I love really it. We could all go out for a beer so or I'd than me, and you're uh, you know, it's a privilege for you to talk to me. I'm really glad we were able to talk about this. And um, so before we go, I want to make sure, um, Josh, if you wouldn't mind maybe just giving a brief uh, rundown of this book. And then, I, like I said, I'd love to schedule a time maybe for you to come back on. And we could just talk about yeah, that. Sure. So you're talking about the genealogical Adam and Eve. I am sorry. I lost the jacket. It doesn't look as pretty. As <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, Mike, have you read it yet? Would you be willing to take a read? I've read three of your books. So you read yeah. one of mine. I'd, I'd be happy to read it. I'm, I'm sorry. I haven't done so yet, but I will. All right. So <laughs> do me a favor. Would you read it and, and like post an article at EMV or, or let me know? I'd love to know. Would you promise okay. me to do that? Yeah, I will do. Will do. <laughs> I think you might agree with me on some things. Uh, you know, he says we disagree a lot, but we agree a lot. I mean, I think this book shows how consistent okay. with mainstream science without uh -huh. having to challenge it. I mean, you can challenge it too if you want to. It doesn't require you to accept it, but consistent with mainstream science, okay. consistent, with, consistent with the idea that we share common descent with the great apes, okay. Adam and Eve could have been specially created as recently as just 6,000 years ago, and they'd be ancestors of all of us. They could have been you know, created without without parents, all that would, you know, and it, and it ends up to be actually, you know, essentially, uh, you know, like the traditional de novo account of Adam and Eve that, you know, your grandmother would have believed in Genesis mm -hmm. and that's actually not in conflict with Genesis. Now, I think that's important because, you know, look, scientists are going to have controversy. Mike and I are going to debate about this probably till he dies and that's okay. <laughs> me, uh, me. <laughs> Why do you say me and not, not say you? Oh, you and I together <laughs> will fight with each other about this stuff because scientists argue. But the fact of the matter is we I don't didn't. have to worry about that as people who follow Jesus and take scripture seriously. There isn't really the same sort of things at stake that we've thought. And I think that's, that's why this ends up becoming important. It can become a conversation we participate in for the fun of it to see what science leads us, not because there's actually a threat to how we read scripture. Right. Yeah. It's so excellent. I'm going to link that in the show notes as well. I know it wasn't the theme of our discussion, but I want to make sh encourage people to grab that. Sorry, I keep forgetting where my camera is at. Um, Dr. Behe's latest Darwin um, devolves right here. I, 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 I terrible. I keep losing the jackets, all these because yeah. I spend so much time with them. You know, that's that's why. Folks can recognize it in the bookstore here. <laughs> yeah. So I will link that in the show notes. I'll link anything else that either of you two want me to put in the show notes as you well. You got to put in print that Mike agreed to read my book and give a comment on it. And, <laughs> and, and, and who knows? Maybe we, maybe we can have... No, uh, it, man. I, 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 I really was... I really loved your first book. I mean, I was in college. It really opened my eyes to a lot of things. And that's part of you want to put me on the path that I'm here right now. It would mean a lot to me if you did, Mike. Great. Great. Very thank good. you very much. <laughs> right. Well, thank you both so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, gentle listeners, give us your feedback, you know, leave a comment, share this episode. We want to encourage these types, more of these dialogues here on the Pat Flynn show. So thanks again to both of my wonderful guests and thank you for listening. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs>